Well, a few years ago, it was one evening, we were all at home, and the power went out at our house. I don't remember if it was a storm that caused it or just one of those random outages that takes place, but we found ourselves without power and without light, and it was night, so it was dark. So I went to that closet uh, near our kitchen, you know, the closet where you keep stuff, the closet where we have, you know, um, batteries and light bulbs and extra rolls of paper towels. Everybody has a closet like that in their house. And I went there because that's where we kept our bag of flashlights. So I'm looking for a flashlight. So I got to the closet, I pulled out a flashlight, and it didn't work. No, battery was dead. Then I found another flashlight, it didn't work either. I found eight flashlights <laughs> in that closet. Eight. And not one of them worked. And we had no batteries. So uh, we ended up lighting a few candles and pretending like it was the 18th century for a while until finally the power came back on and it was cause for great rejoicing because what would we do without light? Well, today we begin our new Advent series called Light of the World, which will take us all the way through to Christmas Eve. And we're going to spend all four weeks in just one passage in the New Testament in the Gospel according to John. Now, you're going to notice right away that this is not a traditional Christmas text, but it is all about the light of the world. So I'm going to read through the entire text that we're going to study, all 14 verses, and we're going to go back to just what we're looking at for today as we begin. So John chapter 1, I'm going to read the first 14 verses, just watch it on the screen, or if you have your Bible or a Bible app on your phone, you can read it. I'm reading from the ESV version. John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." Now, like I told you, that doesn't sound much like the Christmas story. You know, there's no star, no shepherds, there's no Mary, no Joseph, no manger, none of that. And yet, all of it's there if we look hard enough. Now, today we're going to start with just the first five verses of John chapter 1, uh, and then we're going to dig through and see what we learn today. So let me read again those first five verses again. Listen carefully. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I want to focus on three words John uses in these first five verses, and we're going we're to unpack them today. First is the word word, and then life. And then light, beginning first with the power of the word, the power of the word. Uh, the very, one of the very first classes I took when I went to college uh, years ago was a class called Humanities. Uh, it was actually a two-year cycle of courses, uh, and it began with a combination of history, uh, philosophy, and uh, literature. And our first reading assignment, as I recall, uh, was to read the classic work Beowulf. How many of you ever had to read Beowulf in college? <laughs> okay. Beowulf was written like a thousand years ago, uh, and it's an epic story of an ancient hero who, who does all sorts of stuff, rescues kingdoms and kills dragons. But in reading that, I was like way over my head. You know, what I read in high school was, you know, Sports Illustrated and stuff like that. I'm reading Beowulf. Uh, and our first assignment that first fall freshman year was to write a four-page paper on heroism in ancient literature. 
heroism in ancient literature. Now, I've been told by an upperclassman friend that this particular professor, who was legendary around our campus um, for his teaching, that all he really cared about at this point in his career, and he was almost 80 years old, I think he was 80 years old, was just that students uh, spelled words correctly. He said, no matter what you write about, just don't misspell any words, and he'll give you a pretty decent grade. Okay, so I was really careful. I wrote what I thought was a pretty awesome paper, very awesome paper, actually, on heroism. And when I got it back, I got a D minus. <laughs> D minus, red marks all over this paper. And what had happened was, in four pages, I had misspelled the word hero 13 times. <laughs> like a sandwich. You know, you write with some words and they just look right. That's, uh, it looked right to me at that time. So even though I got all the other words correct, I got that word wrong and it ruined my grade. One word ruined my grade. Now we all know that words have power. Uh, words like love, hate. Words like sorry, forgiveness. Words like cancer, a remission. Even simple words like yes or no, depending on the question, will you marry me, are incredibly powerful words. I saw this quote this week, words have energy and power, power to help, to heal, to hurt, to humiliate, and to humble. Or think about the word that's your name, Susan, Tom, Brian. When someone knows or remembers your name, it's you who are known or remembered. Someone speaks your name across a crowded room. You can hear it, and they make you pay attention. Someone forgets your name. It's you who are forgotten. Power. John here points not just to the power of a word, but to the power of the word. In the beginning was the word, he says. Notice that word is capitalized. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. It's, it's the translation of the Greek word logos. Now, that's the root word from which we get our English word logic or logical. And in the ancient Greek word, this was a Greek world, this was a powerful word. It was a very significant word, logos. It carried the, the sense of meaning of the organizing principle of all things. That which gives meaning to all things, logos. Now, to give you an example, it would be like, um, let's say I get a brand new car for Christmas. You know, one of those Lexus uh, automobiles with the big bow on it. In case you're wondering about any gift lists or whatever. Uh, let's say I get a brand new Lexus for Christmas and I immediately put it in my backyard, open up the trunk, fill it with dirt and use it as a planter. You would be saying, I don't think you understand the logos, the meaning, the purpose of that automobile. See, for the ancient Greeks, the word logos was how one discovered the meaning of life. It's how you understood the reason for your existence, a powerful word. In the 4th century BC, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, you've probably heard of him, said this, logos is what makes it possible for human beings to perceive the difference between what is just and unjust, between what is good and what is evil. A couple of centuries later, just about 25 years before Jesus' birth, another Greek philosopher named Philo wrote that Logos is the bridge between an unknown transcendent deity and the material universe where human beings live. But the problem was the ancient Greeks couldn't quite agree on what the Logos was. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but there were basically two schools of thought in the ancient world about Logos. There were those called the Epicureans who followed a philosopher named Epicurus, and he taught that the Logos of life, the purpose of life, was pleasure and enjoyment. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The Epicureans the Epicurean philosophy. The other group were called the Stoics. Now, the Stoics believed that the logos, the meaning of life, was a disciplined life, to live a life of morality, to do what is right and just. And in many ways, those schools of thought still kind of exist today, a couple of thousand years later. See, John understands this, and he's writing to try to connect with the Greek culture by saying, in the beginning was the word, logos. The Greeks would say, great, great, John, tell me what it is. Tell me what it's all about. But John was also writing to people of Jewish background, 
out of the, the Hebrew culture. And for Jews, the word word was also powerful and significant. For to the Jews, it meant the very speech of God. The very truth of Yahweh in the Old Testament. The prophets would say, the word of the Lord came to me, and they would deliver that word to the people. So John then points his Jewish readers back to the very first book of the Torah, the book of Genesis, that we call Genesis. Do you remember how the Bible starts? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Notice that the world was dark. We'll come back to this. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Notice, how did God create in the Jewish mind? How did God create? He spoke. God spoke, God said, and when God spoke, things came into existence. So all that is is a result of God's speech, his word. Now, back to John chapter 1, our text for today. In the beginning was the word. Word is capitalized because John is using it as a name, a proper noun, as a title. The word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 2, he says, he was in the beginning with God. So John goes from word, capitalized as a name, to he, the personal pronoun. So the question is, who is the he? Who is he talking about? John is saying that the word is not an abstract concept that the Greeks thought about, not disembodied logic or intelligence. Rather, the word is a person, a he. Then in verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, if you've been with us the last six weeks, when we were wrestling through the book of Colossians and Paul's writing, you know that this sounds familiar. The apostle Paul told us that Jesus is before all things, that all things were created through him and for him, and in him all things hold together. That was our memory verse we worked on for six weeks. So John, in his way, is saying the same thing. To the Greeks, he's saying Jesus is the word, the logos, the organizing principle of all things, the bridge between the transcendent deity and human life. To the Jews, John is saying that Jesus is the word by which God speaks and creates all things. He is the speech by which God reveals himself most fully to human life. To us, living in the 21st century, who know so much about the universe, who know so much about solar systems and planets and galaxies and black holes. He's saying the entire universe itself is evidence for the power of God to create something from nothing by his word. And what John wants us to see is what God creates through his word, Jesus, is life. Life, And that brings us to the second point, the gift of life. The gift of life. Ten years ago this fall, my father suffered a stroke. Uh, a lot of you remember me telling the story over the years, but it was a Sunday morning about 6 a.m. I was up and preparing for a sermon that day that I was going to give at our South Street campus, and the, my cell phone went off. And I've learned through the years that when you get a call on a weekend early in the morning, it's usually bad news from someone in the church family. In fact, just yesterday I got an email, not a call, but an email of someone at South Street who lost their wife just yesterday. So we're gonna talk this afternoon. So that's what I was expecting, only this call was not from someone in the church family, it was from my family, it was my brother Joe. And he told me that our father uh, had had a massive stroke during the night and had stopped breathing on the way to the hospital in the ambulance and was on life support. He further told me that the neurosurgeon who examined our dad had said the bleeding was so significant, the damage so significant to his brain that there was zero chance of meaningful recovery. That was the phrase exactly that they used, zero chance of meaningful recovery. And we both knew what our father wanted. He told us many times that if something like that were to happen, he did not want to be kept alive on machines. He had been very clear about that. He knew his eternal destiny was secure. He was ready. So after a very short and hard conversation, my brother and I decided that's what we would do. If that was the news, we'd let him go. 
And I hung up the phone, got in the shower, started to prepare. And in the shower, I was thinking not about my sermon that day, but about what I might say at my dad's memorial service, which is coming up probably in a couple of days. So uh, just as I was getting dressed and out of the shower, my brother called again, picked up the phone again. He said, hang on a second. He said, a second neurosurgeon looked at the same scan and told me we'd been given bad information. Went on with some details saying that the, the second neurosurgeon said the bleed was not inside my father's brain, but was what is called a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is on the exterior of the brain, between the brain and the skull, to make it simple, which means um, that if the pressure was released, my dad had a chance for meaningful recovery. So we had another conversation, decided to authorize that procedure. They drilled a hole in my dad's skull, released the pressure. 24 hours, four hours later, he woke up. To make a very long story short, a month later, he was out of the hospital, and he was playing golf by the spring, and he's 86 years old today. So, well, let me just say, I, I, I appreciate that, but not everybody's story goes like that, right? Uh, I, not everybody's story goes like that, but ours did. And we had 10 more years of my dad's life. And I tell that story because we know that somewhere in our hearts, we know that life is a gift. We know that. But we usually take it for granted every day until something happens and we see the greatness of the gift of life. So John's talking about, he says, in him, the word, the logos, Jesus was life. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now, what does John mean by life? Is he talking about biological life? Well, yes, because through Jesus, God created all life. If you go back to Genesis, you can see the progression of creation. The surface of the newly created earth was dark and formless and void, and then came light, and then came water, and then came vegetation, exactly the order you would expect it, and then came sea life, birds, land creatures, and then finally, the creation of human beings. Genesis 2, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. But as we all know, biological life has its limitations. Psalm 90 says it this way, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and fly away. In other words, Biological life comes with an expiration date. You look on the back of your food, there's a date stamped on it. We all have a date stamped on us. You know, the oldest living person in America today, I believe, is a woman named Hester Ford. She lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. She turned 115 in August. Amazing. But she's not going to live forever, right? The average life expectancy in America today is what? Do you know? 76 years for men. 81 years for women. That's a sobering thought. What if, I think, what if I was thinking about this this week, what if when we greet each other, you know, you meet a stranger, usually one of the first things you say is, hey, I'm, I'm Brian, uh, where are you from? Safe question. What if instead of asking that, we said, hey, I'm Brian, uh, how much time do you have left? <laughs> you know, on average. <laughs> that put a whole different perspective on it, right? The gift of life. You know, millions of dollars are being invested right now in extending human life. It's called anti-aging research. One of the people investing most heavily in this process is a billionaire named Peter Thiel, who has a stated goal of living to be 120 years old. That's his goal. So he follows a regimen of human growth hormone, consumes a paleo diet, I don't even know what that is, uh, doesn't eat sugar, drinks red wine, runs regularly. And in a recent interview, here's what he said. He said, there are three main ways to approach death. You can accept it, you can deny it, or you can fight it. I choose to fight it, he says. I would say, good luck with that, right? <laughs> John says, there's another way to think about life. The life John's talking about is a different kind of life altogether. In John chapter 3, just two chapters after the passage we're looking at today, Jesus has a fascinating conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Listen to this conversation. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, that's interesting, in the darkness, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless the one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's Jesus talking about? What does it mean to be born 
again, are born from above, to be born of the Spirit. What is this new life? The Bible teaches, I believe, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot, that, new, that, that Jesus gives new life in four ways. That new life comes through faith, and it means four things. First, it means we can receive the gift of a new heart, of a new heart. Forty years ago, rock star Bruce Springsteen sang a song called Everybody's Got a Hungry Heart. You may remember it. And he was right, because that's true. The human heart is always hungry. Your heart, my heart, the heart of everyone you know in your family, every one of your friends is hungry, hungry for love, hungry for acceptance, hungry for forgiveness. And Jesus offers a new heart through the cross. John, Paul told us, remember last week or two weeks ago, that Jesus canceled our sin by nailing it to the cross. He promises us the gift of a new heart through faith. Secondly, he gives us the gift of new identity. Every human being longs to know who they are and how to think of themselves, how to define themselves. The gospel tells us that in Jesus, we are defined. We are chosen, loved, adopted as God's children, that we no longer identify ourselves by our culture, by our ethnicity, by our past, by our failures, by our successes. We are now identified by the love of Jesus for us because we belong to him. Thirdly, the gospel gives us the gift of new purpose. Every human being is hungry for purpose to know why we are here. Why does my life exist? What's the logos, the meaning of my existence? In John chapter 10, Jesus explains in a rather unusual way, says, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then this, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. That word translated abundantly is a beautiful word. It means fullness, to have full life, more life, to have overflowing life. Jesus is talking about that life being possible now. That's the life he gives us now. We experience that when we understand his purpose for our lives. We live out that purpose by serving in his eternal kingdom and to live for his glory. That's what we mean by having an impact where you are. And finally, he gives us the gift of new destiny. Every human being hungers to know where they are going. What's next? It's why the Egyptians built the great pyramids. It's why... Uh, some people believe in reincarnation. It's why some people have their bodies cryogenically frozen. What's next? In John chapter 3, in that same conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See, biological, gift is, biological life is a gift. It's a gift to be enjoyed, protected, and treasured. It is. It's good. But biological life, my life, your life is limited, comes to an end. But the good news is there is another kind of life, a new life, a spiritual life, an abundant and eternal life that Jesus promises. And that is the source of our hope. Because the third word he talks about is light. We're going to talk about the hope of light. That's the third point today, the hope of light. A number of years ago, my mom and dad came to visit us. I think it was Thanksgiving or Christmas time. We had just moved into a new house, and they had not been to this new house before. Um, so when we showed them to their, the guest room where they were going to stay, we were careful to show them, uh, especially my dad, the pathway to the bathroom upstairs. Because uh, to get to the bathroom, you had to walk out of the guest room, down a short hallway, then turn left to go to the bathroom. Because if you turn right, there's an open stairway there and a short, like five steps down to a landing. So it would be kind of dangerous in the middle of the night. Down the hallway, turn left. Got it, Dad? Got it. Next morning, I'm up making coffee, and my dad comes down, and he's, 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 he, he's walking kind of like this. He doesn't look right. I said, Dad, what's, are you okay? And he said, yeah, well, yeah, I had kind of a problem last night. Well, he got up to go to the bathroom, walked down the hallway, forgot which way to turn, and in the darkness, he turned right, fell down that little, stumbled down that little flight of stairs and rammed his ribs right on the railing and, and, and severely bruised, if not broke, a rib. And we felt terrible uh, because we didn't have a, a nightlight in that hallway. All we had to do was stick a little nightlight in there, which we did then, and to this day we call that Papa's nightlight. Um, <laughs> 
John says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. All we needed in that little hallway was a simple light. Just a small light in that little hallway. Because even a small light would shine in the darkness, right? And the darkness would be powerless to overcome even a small light because light always drives out darkness. That's what John's saying. So what does John mean by darkness? In John's gospel and throughout the Bible, darkness is symbolic of the fallen state of all of creation. Darkness is symbolic for sin and brokenness and evil. Darkness is the absence of the light of truth and grace and redemption and hope. And where there is no light, darkness covers everything and obscures and confuses and disorients. But John says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So the question is, what or who is the light? In verse 4, John writes, in him, remember, in him, the word logos, a person, Jesus, was life, not just biological life, but this new spiritual life, and that life was the light of men, he says. So John is saying that Jesus is the word, the logos of God. Jesus is the life, and therefore, he is also the light that shows the way that brings hope. And that is where the story of Advent begins. Listen to these familiar words, but listen to them with that whole passage in John as a backdrop. Luke chapter 2. And in the same region, there were shepherds out on the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Ah, there's the familiar story. There's the story we hear every year. But notice, the shepherds were watching their flocks by night. It's dark. The whole world is dark. And suddenly they're surrounded by what? Light, the glory of the Lord, a light so bright they are terrified. And then comes the word of hope. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now I think you would agree with me that we don't have to look very far or very hard to see that our world is dark. Our world's a dark place. Just yesterday morning, my Twitter feed on the news, stabbing on the London Bridge in London. No matter what day you look at the news, that's what you're gonna see. The world is a dark place. And maybe you don't have to look very far, very hard to see clouds of darkness creeping into your own heart or life or family. Maybe it's the darkness of guilt or regret. Jesus offers the light of a new heart, the promise of a new heart through forgiving grace. Maybe the darkness is is confusion um, about identity. You wonder who, who you are, why you're here. Does your life really matter to anyone? And Jesus gives you the gift of new identity and new purpose. Yes, you matter. I know you. You belong to me. Follow me. Or maybe it's the darkness of pain, loss, or grief. And Jesus offers the the light of new identity, new, new, new destiny. New destiny is life and hope. So as we enter Advent season, as you take walks at night, you drive through your neighborhood, and you notice the Christmas lights, like those we have up around here. No matter how goofy they might be at the house next door, Or when you look at the lights on your own tree, if you decorate your tree like that, remember John's ancient words. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
We're going to close our service today with communion. Time to take the bread and cup. Remember that the word that became flesh also went to the cross as the final sacrifice for our sins. In a moment, the ushers are going to pass out the trays. Please remember there are two cups stacked together in each spot. Take both cups, hold them till everyone is received, and that'll lead us through the remembrance of bread and cup. And if you're new with us today, please share it with us. If you put your faith in Jesus, just take the bread and cup right along with us this morning. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for taking on flesh and coming into our world that we can know who you are and what you're like. Thank you that we can receive the light and life that you offer and that we can live with great hope. So we ask you by your spirit to meet us once again at this year table through bread and cup. Amen.